Incidentally, at the time of uh, Kepler, the problem of what drove the planets around the sun was answered in certain, certain, by some people by saying that there were angels behind here beating their wings and pushing the planet along around orbit. As we'll see that that answer is not very far from the truth, the only difference is that the angels sit in a different direction and the wings go in a different direction. So uh, what is this law of gravitation that you're going to talk about? The law is that uh, two bodies or bodies exert a force upon each other, which is inversely as the square of the distance between them and varies directly as the product of their masses. And the mathematic mathematically, we can write that great law down in the formula, some kind of a constant times the product of the two masses divided by the square of the distance. Now, if I add the remark that a body reacts to a force by accelerating or by changing its velocity every second to an extent inversely as its mass. It, it reacts, uh, it changes velocity more if the mass is lower and so on, inversely as the mass. Then I have said everything about the law of gravitation that needs to be said. Everything else is a consequence, a mathematical consequence of those two things that I said. That's a remarkable enough phenomenon in itself that the next lecture will consider this in more detail. Now, I know you're not all uh, here. I know some of you are, but you're not all mathematicians. And so you cannot all immediately see all of the consequences of these two remarks. <laughs> and so what I would like to do in this lecture is to briefly tell you the story of the discovery, tell you what some of the consequences are, what the effect of this discovery had on the history of science, what kinds of mysteries such a law entails, something about the refinements made by Einstein and uh, possibly the relation to other laws of physics. The history of the thing, uh, briefly, is this, that the ancients first observed the way the planets seemed to move about in the sky and concluded that they all went around, well, along with the Earth, went around the sun. This discovery was later con made independently by Copernicus after they had forgotten, the people had forgotten that it had already been made. Now, the next thing, question that came up in to study was exactly how do they go around the sun? That is, exactly what kind of motion? Do they go with the sun at the center of a circle, or do they go in some other kind of a curve? How fast do they move, and so on? And this discovery took a longer to make. The times after Copernicus were times in which there were great debates about whether the planets, in fact, went around the sun along with the Earth, or whether the Earth was at the center of the universe, and so on. And there were considerable arguments about this. When a man named Tycho Brahe got an idea of a, a way of answering the question, he thought that it might perhaps be a good idea to look very, very carefully and to record where the planets actually appear in the sky. And then the alternative theories might be distinguished from one another. This is the key of modern science and is the beginning of the true understanding of nature, this idea that to look at the thing, to record the, the details, and to hope that in the information thus obtained may lie a clue to one or another of a possible theoretical interpretation. So Tycho, who was a rich man and owned, I believe, an island near Copenhagen, outfitted his island with great brass circles and special observing positions uh, situations, chairs that you could look through little holes, and recorded night after night the position of the planets. It's only through such hard work that we can find out anything. When these, all these data were collected, they came into the hands of Kepler, who then tried to analyze what kinds of motions the, the planets made around the sun. And uh, he did this by a method of trial and error. At one stage, he thought he had it. He, he figured out that they went around the sun in circles with the sun off center and noticed that one planet, I think it was Mars, but I don't know, uh, was eight minutes of arc off. And he decided that this was too big for Tycho Brahe to have made an error and that this was not the right answer. 
So because of the precision of experiments, he was able to proceed and find that, to go on to another trial, and found, in fact, ultimately this. Three things. First, that the planets went in ellipses around the sun with the sun at a focus. An ellipse is a curve you all artists know about because it's a foreshortened circle, or children know about because somebody told them that if you take a string and tie it to two tacks and put a pencil in there, it'll make an ellipse. These two tacks are the foci, and if the sun is here, the shape of the orbit of a planet around the sun is one of these curves. The next question is, and going around the ellipse, how does it go? Does it go faster when it's near the sun, slower when it's further from the sun, and so on? We take away the other focus, we have the sun then and the planet going around. And Kepler found the answer to this too. He found this, that if you put the position of the planet down in two, at two times separated by some definite time, let's say uh, three weeks, and then at another place in the orbit, put the positions of the planets again separated by three weeks, and draw lines from the sun to the planet, technically called radius, radius vectors. But anyway, lines from the sun, <laughs> sun to the planet. Then the area that's enclosed in the orbit of the planet and the two lines that are separated by the planet's position three weeks apart is the same no matter what part of the orbit the thing is on. So that it has to go faster when it's closer in order to get the same area as it goes slower when it's further away and in a precise manner. Some several years later, he found the third rule, and uh, that had not to do with the exactly a motion of a single planet around the sun, but related the various planets to each other. And it said that the times that it took the planet to go all the way around was related to the size of the orbit, and that the times went as the square root of the cube of the size of the orbit, and for the size of the orbit is the diameter all the way across the biggest distance on the ellipse. So uh, he has these three laws which are summarized by saying it's an ellipse and that equal areas are swept in equal times and that the time to go around varies as a three-half power of the size, the square root of the cube of the size. So there's three laws of Kepler, which is a very complete description of the motion of the planets around the sun. The next question was, what makes him go around? Well, how can we understand this in more detail? Or is there anything else to say? In the meantime, Galileo was investigating the laws of motion. Incidentally, at the time of uh, Kepler, the problem of what drove the planets around the sun was answered in certain, certain by some people by saying that there were angels behind here beating their wings and pushing the planet along around the orbit. As we'll see that that answer is not very far from the truth, the only difference is that the angels sit in a different direction and the well, wings go in a different direction. <laughs> but the point that the angels sit in a different direction is the one that I must now come to. <laughs> Galileo, in studying the laws of motion and doing a number of experiments to see how balls roll down inclined planes and pendulous swung and so on, discovered a idealization, a great principle called the principle of inertia, which is this, that if a thing has nothing acting on it, if an object has nothing acting on it and is going along at a certain velocity in a straight line, it will go at the same velocity at exactly the same straight line forever. Unbelievable though that may sound to anybody who has tried to make a ball roll forever, <laughs> the idealization did, is correct and that if there were no influences acting, such as a friction on the floor and so on, the thing would go at a uniform speed forever. The next point was made by Newton, who discussed the next question, which is when it doesn't go in a straight line, then what? <laughs> and he answered this way, that a force is needed to change the velocity in any manner. First, for instance, if you're pushing it in a direction that it moves, it will speed up. If you find that it changes direction, then the force have, must have been sideways. And that the force can be measured by the product of two effects. First, how much does the velocity change in a small interval of time? How fast is the velocity changing? How much is it accelerating 
in this direction, or how much is the velocity changing when it changes direction? That's called the acceleration. And when that's multiplied by a coefficient called the mass of an object, or its inertia coefficient, then that together is a force. One can measure the, for instance, if one has a stone on the end of a string and swings it in the circle over his head, then one can measure, if one finds one has to pull, the reason is that the speed of the, the, the velocity, the speed is not changing as it goes around the circle, but it's changing its direction, so there must be perpetually an in-pulling force. And this uh, is proportional to the mass, so that if we were to take two different objects, first swing one, and then swing another one at the same speed around the head and measure the force in the second one, that second one, uh, the, the new force is bigger than the other force in the proportion that the masses are different. This is a way of measuring the masses, by how much, how hard it is to change the speed. Now, then Newton saw uh, from this that, for instance, to take a simple example, if a planet is going in a circle around the sun, no force is needed to make it go sideways tangentially. If there were no force at all on it, it would have just keep coasting this way. But actually, the planet doesn't keep coasting this way, but finds itself later not out here where it would go if there were no force at all, but further down toward the the sun. In other words, its velocity, its motion, has been deflected toward the sun. So what the angels have to do is to beat their wings in toward the sun all the time, that the motion to keep it going in a straight line has no known reason. The reason why things coast forever has never been found out. The law of inertia is no known origin. So the angels don't exist, but the continuation of the motion does. But in order to obtain the falling operation, we do need a force. So it was, became apparent that the origin of that the force was toward the sun. As a matter of fact, Newton was able to demonstrate that the statement that equal areas are swept in equal times was a direct consequence of the simple idea that all of the changes in velocity are directed exactly to the sun, even in the elliptical case. And maybe I'll have time next time to show you how that works in detail. So from this law, he would confirm the idea that the force is toward the sun. And from knowing how the periods of the different planets vary with the distance away from the sun, it's possible to determine how that force must weaken at different distances. And he was able to determine that the force must vary inversely as the square of the distance. Now, so far, he hasn't said anything. Yes, because he only said two things which Kepler said in a different language. One is exactly equivalent to the statement that the force is toward the sun, and the other is exactly equivalent to the statement that the law is inversely as the square of the distance. But people had seen in telescopes the Jupiter's satellites going around Jupiter, and it looked like a little solar system. So the satellites were attracted to Jupiter, and the moon is attracted to the Earth, and this goes around the Earth. It's attracted the same way. So it looks like everything's attracted to everything else. And so the next statement was to generalize this and to say that every object attracts every other object. 